an attraction. And, uh, and artists, when I was a, a child in Manchester, I was aware of, of Lowry, for example. Um, uh, so uh, whether it's weekly magazines like Eagle with cutaway drawings which reveal the inner workings of the, uh, all, all, all the things that, that move and, uh, and have a dynamic. So uh, perhaps all the things that excited the Italian futurists at the beginning of the, uh, of the century and which in many ways have also inspired other architects. Le Corbusier, for example, had a romance with, with flying machines and devoted a book to it. And it was one of his books that I discovered in my local lending library that um, towards a new architecture. But it was the juxtaposition of classical architecture with fast hydroplanes and, and so on. So, um, so as a child, uh, I was, I mean, I remember sketching and I remember being enthused and excited by these machines uh, and, uh, and speed. You had an early love for books, I read as well. What did you find in books which you did not find in the world around you? Um, the books were really of another, more glamorous world. I've mentioned towards a new architecture, but it could be in the nature of materials, Henry Russell Hitchcock, or later it could be um, 1950s copies of the Architectural Review showing the landscapes of Berla Marx uh, in South America, Niemeyer, um, and, um, and works in Scandinavia at the time. So, um, so running through this, even though my workplace was far removed from the world of architecture in Manchester Town Hall, because I left school at 16, um, uh, and then I did national service for two years. So really running as a thread through all of these different things was my own private world of sketching, dreaming, enthusing, being excited by all the things outside my workplace. So if you can imagine that discovering the possibility of being an architect, studying to be an architect, discovering a school of architecture, an architect studio, um, that was no longer work. Work was something that um, you went to to earn money, to pay into the family. Um, so, um, so in that sense, to be able to discover that the things that excited me um, that one could do those. I mean, I would pay to do it, and I did literally pay to do it. Last question on childhood, because in some biographies, we all, I played a lot of football, did a lot of sports in my childhood. With you, I don't know, but I got the feel that you always kind of were searching, looking into different worlds already. Was that because those worlds were so interesting or were you escaping the actual world around you? Um, I never thought of it at the time of escaping the world around me. I mean, the world around me was a kind of um, industrial suburb of Manchester. And, um, and so if I would go off on my bicycle um, into the countryside to discover the countryside and, um, and traditional buildings, interestingly, although I probably wouldn't have been articulate on that at the time. So there's a degree of perhaps post-rationalization there. But I was in all kinds of ways an outsider. I mean, I never got into team sports and uh, and so the whole sports thing, which fascinates me. I mean, I love cross country skiing and for the last, I don't know, 20 odd years, I've been doing annually a cross country ski marathon with 11 or 12,000 other people. 
And I do a kind of marathon bike ride with a group of, of friends, and that's incredibly social. Um, but apart from that, most of my cycling is a, is a kind of solitary thing. Um, and I find that also quite therapeutic. I mean, it's a zen-like thing, the relationship between myself, the machine, whether it's the skis, whether it's the cycle. And I also use that time to be, to be thinking, to be cross-examining. So um, in one sense, it's a release. Um, in another sense, it's a change of place. But it's also a kind of inner discovery when I, I, I really find time, because a lot of my time is with teams, with groups, going to building sites. Um, and engaging with really interesting people who, um, who have the need of a building. And I find that, that dialogue um, absolutely central to, to the design process. I started flying with sailplanes, high-performance sailplanes, which is solar flight. I mean, you fly vast distances at high speeds um, with, no, with no engine. I mean, pure solar, driven by nature. And, um, and I've gone on to pilot many different kinds of craft, flying machines, helicopters, microlides, fast jets, um, about 75 different types. For me, there are very, I wouldn't say it's seamless, but there are very, very close links between art, painting, sculpture, architecture, design, aircraft, automobiles, locomotives. It's, it, that's a seamless world. Um, uh, perhaps over time, I've become much more um, uh, I've realized the important links between individual buildings and infrastructure, the infrastructure of public spaces, of connections, of transportation, bridges, uh, terminals, uh, the, the kind of all the, the sort of urban glue that binds together the individual buildings. That's not to say I'm still not passionate about architecture. Obviously, I'm, I'm totally driven by it. Um, but the bigger picture uh, is arguably even more, more important. The master plan, the concept. Um, I mean, your journey here from Denmark will be, your memory will be the route, the journeys, the path that you took from your home, the way back, the street, um, uh, the connections, the terminal, the airports. Uh, uh, that will be, and, and that determines the quality of life in the same way that the individual building determines that. Or oh, it's a huge influence. In the, I, I get your point, um, but in this, uh, let's say, complexity of infrastructure, of traveling, still meeting your buildings, you meet a kind of simplicity, and I mean that in the positive sense of the word. Um, <clears throat> and simplicity strikes me when we're flying, for example, this kind of weightlessness. Uh, it's very complicated flying, but at the same time it's very simple. Yes, it's, it, the, um, it is that essence of light, lightness, and that I think in spirit touches a lot of the, the buildings. I think probably the best buildings that we've done are those which have those qualities. But when I was talking about infrastructure, I suppose I was saying that, that as a designer, um, I feel that, that we've gone beyond architecture. And 
the interest in infrastructure has influenced the architecture of the individual buildings. So if I took you around each of these models, I talk about the public space on top of the Reichstag. They never asked for public space. It was never part of their concept, their, their brief. Um, there was a model of the viaduct where you seem to fly through the sky. You're literally in the clouds. And if we look at the individual towers here, you'll find that the public domain, the public space, penetrates those buildings. There's an interaction. Um, so that interest in the city and infrastructure manifests itself in designs which go beyond architecture and which influence, when it is pure architecture, influences the architecture. probably has a dominant theme, it probably has a dominant story, but the building will embody several different stories. There'll be the story perhaps of how it's made, there'll be the story of how it might reinterpret um, a, um, how can I say, if you, if, if you think about a, a tower or you think about a conventional airport, it may re-examine that building type and come up with something which is different, but different not just for the sake of being different, but different for a good reason. So if you take a tower, conventionally it has a central core. Um, when we question that on the building immediately behind me, the Hong Kong Bank, there were very good reasons for rejecting that model, even though if you analyze pretty well every tower on the planet, it would have a central core. So we broke with that tradition. We reinvented the tower by fragmenting the core, putting it on the ends. Again, you can see it. So you have free space. So you can see from one side to the other. It's not blocked and it's flexible. So you could put even a dealer's room, which would be unthinkable in a tower. And that's exactly what they did many years later. Or you could consider an airport um, like Stansted, which again questioned the conventional idea of a terminal, which was that it was a sandwich of space and the roof had a lot of ducts with their handling plant on the top, which cooled the air lots of electric lighting then because you've got no natural light so you've got the heat load of the lighting very energy consuming and not very nice i mean claustrophobic which is why airports had such a bad name when we reconsidered that and put all the air handling at the bottom underneath so that you could open the top to natural light and sunlight so for most of the time, you didn't need electric light. You suddenly had something that was joyful, that would uplift the spirits, and suddenly becomes popular with the most important people who are the paying customers. Um, it's also energy efficient. Now I can, if I describe that, I'm describing several different stories. I'm telling you one about energy consumption. I'm telling you one about joy. I'm telling you one about how you build a building. And I'm telling you another about how you question and challenge. Looking at your buildings, you find some elements that come again and again, like you have talked about light already, a certain lightness as well, uh, transparency. Sometimes that's almost spiritual. I mean, I think that the task of the Reichstag was in a way lifting the burden of history. And, um, and Christo and Jean-Claude's wrapping was symbolically very important in that process. Um, so it was 
philosophically confronting history, keeping the graffiti, the civic vandalism, the marks of the mason, um, the attacks by bullets and shells, but somehow transforming that, lightening it, um, and involving the public uh, and the politicians who are answerable to the public. So in a way creating the, the public space at the top and the ability to have a coffee, a terrace, a meal. Um, but at the time, I mean, the, that now is hugely popular. I mean, the queues just go on forever. Everybody wants to go there. But at the time, it was very contentious. I mean, politicians were saying as a group, why would anybody want to go onto the roof? And if they got there, why would they want to stay and have a coffee? And then, of course, it's not big enough because so many people want to go there. So that turns into another question. Why didn't you make it bigger? Uh, <laughs> so. thinking that with every project that you do, despite of the complexity of it, you want to end up with a simplicity that contains the complexity. I think it's a search for... Um, it, it, it's a search for legibility. Um, it's a search for a simple analog experience in a digital world. So uh, a building type like an airport is unbelievably complex in terms of what happens behind the scenes. There are so many different interests, the movement of baggage, security, all the things that you don't see. Uh, so how do you somehow, through a complex process, distill it down. It's a bit like somebody saying, um, I can write you an essay, I can write you a long letter, but to write a poem, that's, that's a tough one. Um, so how do you distill all that complexity down so that for the people who really matter, you make it as great an experience as you can? And in some ways, these buildings at an epic scale Beijing, the largest in the world at the moment. Um, how do you, it's actually a compact building when you think about it. And if you take the Apple headquarters, which is a very large circular building with a great green heart set in a huge uh, park, everybody's reaction quite reasonably is, I mean, it's a huge building. But what you're not seeing is what would normally happen for a campus. A campus would be, could be up to 30 buildings and then all the movement between that. A little bit like Beijing Airport. Beijing Airport in other cities where the airports have grown up over time are a whole series of separate buildings and then the movement between those buildings and the baggage between those buildings uh, is not much fun. Um, so if you if it's apple, what do you prefer to walk between on asphalt through cars from one building on one side of the site to the other, or to be able to jog, cycle, walk in a great park and have proximity to your colleagues because you're trying to create a, a family entity, albeit a very, very large uh, building for a very large family. Um, would you rather move under one roof like an artificial sky or would you rather go from one terminal through a maze of roads, jungle of cars, lorries, trucks? I mean, 
It's uh, so, and obviously it's human nature. We're all interested in the tallest, the longest, the biggest. But for every one of those, um, I mean, next week, for example, uh, we are doing the groundbreaking for a small building in Manchester, and that's a Maggie's Cancer Center. And it's really a big house. And, and there, learning a lot from my time long past, but which I continue to revisit, learning a lot from Scandinavia, um, uh, in terms of something which is of this time, modern, but warmth and domestic, and at one with the landscaping. I mean, a great tradition. Um, and I remember as a student seeing work of architects who were not name architects outside of Denmark, like Kai Fisker. Um, and, um, and I think if you see that building, you'll understand what I'm saying. It's translated in a way which is different, yes. I mean, people have said, well, it looks like an aircraft wing, the timber structure, um, or it looks um, as if you're influenced by Prouver. Well, of course I am, but it is an, an essay in homeliness, because if you've been diagnosed with cancer, um, you want a reassuring environment if somebody is going to be counseling you. Um, and, um, and flowers are, are important. If you go to a hospital, you always find fresh flowers. You bring flowers to a patient. Um, so that's an integral part of the building, the greenhouse, so that the flowers are produced within the same structure. Um, the same structure grows through, but there's more glass around a part of it. So it, it creates a little hothouse for but that's another story, you see. You had once said um, that architecture is about values as well. What does this mean? I think that um, architecture um, is about integrity, it's about human values, it's about a respect for those. And may be difficult to articulate, but when, um, when a building resonates in a certain way. It may have an integrity of structure, it may have an integrity of form. Um, I think the hospital is a very good example. I mean, again, it is like an airport, hugely complex. And that can produce a very complex building. So you, it then is taken for granted that the hospital experience is a complex and perhaps inevitably frightening experience in the way that the airport used to be a frightening experience. But it doesn't need to be. That I'm absolutely sure of. And I say that as a past patient, having spent time in hospitals, um, I'm very grateful that I've emerged um, to continue life. Um, beyond that experience. Mm. I think really in every aspect of life, in every walk of life, you need the balance between a certain degree of respect and humility um, and to do what you do, for me to do what I do as an architect, a degree of, of self-confidence um, because you are leading a team you're expected to. Um, and that's why I said earlier that I think one aspect of the architect's task is to be a good listener and, um, and, and to hear the many voices that um, the needs that that building will, will answer. And, um, and also to respect the process of making, um, the nobility of making. That's not fashionable. Um, but, and, and in that sense, quality is an attitude of mind. It's not how much money you spend on a building. You've got, you've got really three resources. You've got money, you've got time, and you've got creative energy. Um, 
and it's the creative energy, it's the attitude of how you use those resources as wisely as possible. And some of the great buildings in the world have been achieved when, in the face of economic hardship, some of the best buildings in the world are kind of overnight miracles. They've been created very quickly. Some of the worst buildings in the world have had money thrown at them, and they're awful. lively uh, you have been through a period where you have been sick but we all know that there will probably not be 80 years left in your life so what remains Mr. Foster? I, I continue to do what I do um, uh, I'm fired I'm passionate about designing um, I know that for the privilege of designing, you also pay the price for having to do quite a lot of other things which don't necessarily come so naturally and don't give you the same degree of pleasure, but they kind of come with the, uh, with the task. Um, I suppose that if, if, if there was the opportunity to, um, I think that, um, Buckminster Fuller's analogy of the trim tab, the little tab on the big control surface which um, equalizes the forces and enables the bigger uh, elements to move because of the small kind of catalyst effect, um, uh, then uh, it would be great if, um, if we could address some of those bigger issues. Um, design as a tool to uh, address shelter in the big picture. I mentioned the, the project for Duravi, and there the proposition was that you might be able to recycle, to add the basic services which don't exist, like sanitation, power, water, but you could respect the urban structure which had grown up in those settlements because they're quite, of course they have their darker side, but you have to remember that people have come, they've congregated in these areas because they offer greater hope, greater prosperity from, so, so the challenge of how you transform settlements like that which relate to a huge percentage of the world's population. Um, and I believe that there are alternatives, more human alternatives, more subtle alternatives, to getting the big bulldozers, you know, raising it to the ground and then transporting those communities into, uh, into other modern buildings. So I think that the answer to your short question, which was a rather long answer, would be that you know, we've built airports, we're still excited by those challenges. We've built towers, we're excited by, by that. We're doing a lot of small community buildings, we're excited by that. Um, but the bigger issues are not really addressed by, by architects. And that's, we're talking about billions of people and those are the people who need power. They need clean water. And how do you achieve that? So those, to be able in some small way to make a contribution in that direction, that I think would be very satisfying. Mm -hmm. And that density is quite an important factor, isn't it? To well, the city is about density. Yeah. So it's, and it's about concentration. And, um, and there are certain lessons, again, from history, Georgian London, with row houses walk up uh, four or five stories maximum around uh, gardens which were 
semi-public. Um, so public spaces like parks, um, dense communities, high rise as appropriate, but not lost in a sea of uh, neglected space, um, but part of a weapon in a wider armory, if you like. Um, but that's coming back to the bigger picture. And that's where our conversation really started, which was the importance of infrastructure. Do you think technology in the end is an ally or a threat to our society? Technology can never be a threat. I mean, uh, technology is a means. So the history of architecture, the history of humanity coming out of the cave into a dwelling is a story of technology, of innovation. The high-tech buildings of the past, the cathedrals, they're miracles of technology. Well, of course, any technology you can turn from violent, aggressive, you can turn into something which is violent and aggressive. Um, but that's probably true of anything. You can use medicine to cure, you can use medicine to poison. Um, uh, you can, as Bucky put it, you can convert the killing machine into the living machine. And, um, and that was some of the endeavors after, after the war to harness. Um, but that's also true of, of of space travel and space exploration. Um, so, uh, so it's really, it's how you use the technology. But you can't, you can't move forward, you can't answer the needs. We can't be protected in here when it's raining or snowing or cool in here when we open the windows and it's baking hot outside. That's a technological response. And the technology is changing all the time. So the challenge is to turn it to our advantage. Looking out of the window, I see sculptures, I see art. It's an integral part of, of our lives, as a family, as individuals. Um, it's completely woven in, in the same way that, that those inspirations, influences, subconscious, perhaps subliminal, but they're there. We're all a victim of, uh, of influences, or victim is the wrong word. We're, we're all products, if you like, of influences. And what could, can you verbalize what art does to you in your practice as architect in your life? Why is it important? I think it's an other way of looking at forms of life. I think that it opens you to see new possibilities, to make connections. It makes you, uh, it heightens your sense of, of awareness. Uh, it's another dimension. And, and, and again, there are certain artifacts, there are certain cars. You can see the curve of the back and there's a sort of sensuous quality to that. Um, that for me is, is art. I was looking at an exhibition of locomotives. Um, each one must have been lovingly created and everything works. It's a miniaturized series. Of, I mean, just, I mean, labors of love. And for me, those are pure art. The sailplane is as beautiful as the Brancusi. The Brancusi and the Boccioni the figure flowing in space. Those are inseparable from the best cars of the period. The Chrysler airflow is inseparable from the Chrysler building of Van Allen. Um, the streamlined forms of the Burlington Zephyr and the M10,000 uh, in the 30s, which heralded a new high performance, again, lighter form of locomotion. Um, those are inseparable from the, these incredible works by artists um, around 1913. Uh, so they're kind of magic years, but there's all of these things, they're timeless. They go beyond the style of a certain time. They're, uh, they're classics. <laughs>
question. My son is seven years old and he's quite interested in architecture and books and I imagine him a little bit like you as a young boy. He kind of looks at books and he's totally away. So if he decided to study architecture and he in his study would fall about a book and you as an architect, Norman Foster, what would you like a boy like him to remember you as an architect in 20, 30, 40 years time? I'd like to feel that from um, conversations like this, um, or perhaps film, books, buildings, um, that, um, that he becomes aware that by questioning and by challenging, and by having a degree of determination and conviction and enthusiasm and passion, um, that you really can make a difference to the world and the everyday world that we all live in um, and that that can make a difference and that he could in turn along with his colleagues make a difference in the future. But if he would be looking at a book by you like you looked at the books of Le Corbusier what do you think will fascinate him about you and your architecture? I think it, it, it might be the way that we have rethought, redesigned, reinvented um, the otherwise conventional, what was considered to be a traditional way of doing something. And that we'd done that by going back to roots, going back to basics and questioning from first principles. So what would be fantastic for your son is that if he was able to do that and be able to tear up what we'd done and do something which we discovered, another better way of doing it. The entrance to the exhibition is here and symbolically the Mio Viaduct leads you into the first gallery. This gallery is devoted to sketches and drawings. The drawings here start in 1956. Uh, that's Manchester University. They move on to Yale University and they track through the practices of Team 4, of Foster and Partners, and uh, the Foundation. The idea of entering through a gallery about sketches and drawings is really the importance of the sketch and the fact that it's the start of so many of the designs that you will see in the main gallery that follows then what are the influences going back in time to the 1960s? And the 1960s was arguably 
the birth of what we now call the Green Movement. So the early works and everything that followed really uh, can be related back to these early influences. And here we have a timeline of practice. Perhaps six decades ago, the first practice of Team 4, 1963, and then charting as a timeline the evolution of what today is the present practice, and alongside it, but quite separate from it, the Norman Foster Foundation, working with students to anticipate the future. And then this wall of print is really uh, a testimony for the 10,000 names, the 10,000 colleagues who, since 1963, have made, through their contributions, made this exhibition possible. So we've come from the darkened space of the sketches, and literally the space expands here. Working with uh, Frederick Migaru, the curator, he encouraged the division of the exhibition into a number of sections. And the opening one is nature and urbanity and makes the point that they're really connected. They're encouraging density, preserving nature, avoiding sprawl, um, setting in a way the stage for the wider exhibition itself. And here we have the early projects of Team 4, starting in 1963, and again very much about preserving the landscape. Dense clusters, but with privacy ensured by design. And then there's an inevitable transition, almost uh, seamless, of the projects of the practice, starting with Foster Associates, which is really the birth of the present practice of Foster and Partners. This project for Reliance Controls was a transitional project from the Team 4 practice to the present practice and is very much the birth of a systems approach to design, the integration of system. This project was a pioneering project, both socially and technologically. This small um, amenity center, which brought together dockers and office workers, uh, was revolutionary. It introduced open plan uh, materials that were about conserving energy, uh, it incorporated heat recovery. Uh, these were truly revolutionary in the very early 1970s. So going back in time to these early projects of the late 1960s, the early 1970s, how to communicate some of the ideas which at that time were really revolutionary. They're now much more mainstream. Harvesting energy through solar, through wind power, recycling waste to human waste to fertilizer. So I developed with the model making team the idea of a diorama. So you can start to see the dialogue between the systems uh, in the model and the sketches of that period. In the theme of nature and urbanity and how do you relate to a landscape, this very first project uh, the first in 1963 of digging in a small gazebo um, into the landscape has its reverberations many decades later in the Air Museum for Duxford which is also a memorial to the American airmen who lost their lives in World War II. And again dug into the landscape in the same way uh, the National Botanical Gardens of, of, of Wales, or an elephant house in Copenhagen, all deferring to the landscape. Still under the theme of nature and urbanity, we have Mazda, which is a series of experiments, but essentially it's a community, a research uh, university in the uh, desert in Abu Dhabi, and working with the climate, learning from traditional dwellings, and then combining that with the cutting-edge technology of solar power. And um, so it is, 
today still that experiment 24 hours every day of the year and totally solar powered as a research community. There's a transition in the exhibition from one subject of nature and urbanity to the vertical city and you could say that the high-rise building is emblematic uh, of the modern age, of the modern high-density city. Along the way, we try to show some insights into the process of design, uh, the exploration that might be in sketches and drawings as we talked earlier, but it might be in models which explore different aspects of the design. Here, uh, a high-rise bank in Kuwait. This is a model of the Commerce Bank Tower. It was conceived in the late 1980s, realized in the early 1990s. And it is the first breathing building, the first naturally ventilated high-rise uh, building. This design, which I did as a student, uh, at Yale when I was doing my masters in the 1960s uh, that I uh, eliminated the conventional central core was really the basis of the future uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai uh, bank tower in Hong Kong which for the first time in a high-rise building eliminated the traditional central core of structure and services and instead fragmented it and put it on the edges of a completely flexible loft-like space. This tower was conceived for Swiss Re in London. Again, in London it was revolutionary as a breathing building. The facade opens up. Uh, air movement is encouraged through the spiral. So it's working really like an aircraft wing, creating uh, opposing pressures, low pressure, high pressure drawing air through the building, reducing the energy consumption and also making it a healthier building for the occupant. This tower for Hearst at the time in sustainability terms uh, was pioneering and um, at a completely different visual level there is a certain resonance between these diagraded faceted structures and the early Brancusi endless uh, column with its beautifully uh, proportioned uh, rhomboid shapes. You could say in many ways that we have uh, in anticipating the future reinvented the nature of the workplace, reinvented uh, what a high-rise building is. It was a distinguished critic who said that you could divide all of our projects into two categories, skin and bones. Either that the building is an expression of its skin, its external envelope, perhaps smooth and streamlined, or that it might be the expression of the bones. And uh, you can find the same analogies in the world of sculpture, automobiles, aircraft, very much about the 1913 anticipating the wind tunnel that would streamline revolutionary vehicles like Buckminster Fuller's Dymaxion car. I worked with, with Fuller, affectionately known by his friends as Bucky, for the last 12 years of his life. So my creation of this authentic uh, version was uh, really uh, homage to my mentor. And um, he's perhaps well known for the uh, Dymaxion structures, uh, the diagridded uh, structures uh, which you can see here in the solar house that we worked on together, um, unrealized but hugely influential as a prototype, and also at the time the so-called fly's eye dome, which uh, resolved the structure of a triangulated structure but with openings uh, that would transmit light and also air. So uh, again these are research exercises into an architecture which would work with nature, which would reduce 
the amount of energy, there's an anticipation here of a future still to come. Over the 12 years of our working together, uh, one concept unrealized was the idea of climatrophis. And climatrophis would be like a big, almost transparent, uh, structural filigree structure that would transmit light, air, and within that environment there would be nature, greenery, trees. Um, it was a kind of utopian vision of the workplace of the future. As we move along the models in this part of the exhibition, we're continuing the theme of skin and bones. and. Uh, and the bones, the arch of Wembley Stadium is not only emblematic and symbolic of that historic past, um, but is the, literally the very structure expressed that is holding it up. By contrast, this, um, uh, this complex of uh, musical um, uh, spaces for the performance arts, the sage uh, in the north of England, is by contrast very much about the skin, the voluptuous um, form. Uh, and as we move from that to the Sainsbury Centre, very much the expression of the skin of the building and only its bones, its structure, revealed at the ends, like um, an extrusion. I was encouraged by Frederick, the curator of the exhibition, to create this model of what he sees as a very important project from the past. Unbuilt, it was a, it was a, a house in, in Hampstead. And as you can see, it's very much about the expression of the structure. And uh, incidentally, has a certain resonance with the structure of this building, uh, which you can see uh, outside. Renault, uh, again, a very clear expression of a suspension uh, structure and an element of it here, kind of writ large recreation of the, of the corner module. This is an exploratory project by the foundation team. Uh, we call it the Grasshopper and, um, and it's a part infrastructure, part of the pedestrian route of this um, Chateau Lacoste in Provence. And here this is, in effect, an observation platform. But it's, again, very much the bones of the structure and touches the nature very, very lightly, almost in the same way that this table, uh, which has certain affinities with the lunar explorer of the late 1960s, uh, again, touching the ground lightly and very much an expression of its, of its structure. I've always been fascinated by the streamlined forms of airships, of Zeppelin. Uh, <laughs> 아마 많은 분들이 밖에서도 오시고 또 교내에서도 오셨을 텐데 어, 더운 날씨에 어, 이렇게 멀리서 오셔서 반갑고요. 어, 노만 포스터 경은 이제 지금 출발해서 지금 오고 있습니다. 아마 2, 3분 안에 들어올 것 같고요. 이 공간은 원래 어, 파워플랜트, 서울대학교 파워플랜트로 쓰던 공간이었습니다. 실제로 이렇게 보일러들이 있고, 그 다음에 옆에는 이제 전기 생산하는 공간인데, 어, 어느 순간 이제 그 개별 난방들, 냉난방을 하게 돼서 여기 이제 보일러실은 안 쓰게 됐습니다. 그 2년 전에 저희 학교가 어, 기술의 시대에 문화도 굉장히 중요할 것 같다. 사람들은 많은 인여가 생길 것 같아가지고 학교가 문화의 방점을 두자 이렇게 생각해서 문화예술원을 만들었고요. 그동안 여기서 여러 행사를 진행했습니다. 오늘은 어, 하이테크 아키텍처를 이제 시작하신 노만 포스터 경이 이제 학생들하고 대화를 나누실 나눌 예정이고요. 어, 한 시간 정도 진행될 예정, 예정입니다. 어, 지금 포스터 오피스에서 보내준 영상이 짧은 영상이 있는데 그거를 보시고 계시면 어, 아마 이제 건축가와 이제 학생들이 준비해서 올라올 겁니다. 감사합니다.
안녕하세요. 저는 오늘 강연의 사회를 맡은 건축학과 학생회장 정지은입니다. 오늘 이 자리를 빌어 학생들을 위해서 시간을 내주신 노먼 포스터님께 감사하다는 말씀을 전해드립니다. 박수 한번 부탁드립니다. 시간 관계상 바로 질문 시작하도록 하겠습니다. <웃음> 아. 아, 아. Hello, I'm Chang Kim, majoring in architecture at SNU. Two months ago, I went on a trip to Paris, and I saw your exhi exhibition at the Pompidou Center. Among the exhibition, the future architecture of the universe, especially the last part, was very impressive. For example, the drone port on the moon. I think the moon has its unique environment compared to ours, which enables the, the advantage of cooling easier at night due to big temperature difference throughout the day. And I wonder what will be the best architecture to take advantage of these physical characteristics of the moon. Furthermore, if we, we were to build new structures such as drone station in space, there's the concern that human activities could lead to contamination. Do you believe the humans have the right to potentially co contaminate or disrupt celestial bodies through their actions? From an architecture's perspe perspective, if development were to occur, how far can we allow it to go? I, I, I didn't fully understand the question, but I think it was, it was very much about uh, outer space and regulating outer space. Um, and, but the last part of the... Okay, all right. <laughs> so, sorry. Uh, okay. If we were to build new structures, such as drone station in space, there's the concern that, that human activities could lead to contamination. Sure. Do you believe that humans have the right to potentially contaminate or disturb celestial bodies through their actions? Yes. I think it's more um, a political question than an architectural question. Um, so, uh, first of all, I think in terms of exploration, probably outer space in terms of today must have been exploring the outer edges of what everybody believed was a flat earth in the past. So I think the human spirit is about exploration, is about pushing boundaries. Um, so uh, I think you move into the political domain in terms of preserving outer space. Um, and I think that is literally uncharted territory. Um, but historically, I think mankind has so far controlled uh, issues of, on course, if you like, issues of pollution, uh, nuclear uh, armaments. Um, so. So I think in, in, in the political domain, uh, one can be optimistic, or perhaps a better word is, is hopeful. In terms of, um, I think you're perhaps familiar with some of the work that we've done with NASA and with the European Space Agency. And it, effectively, it's perhaps discovering a new vernacular for lunar or Martian habitations because um, it's almost like going back in time. If you look at architecture before architects, um, it was always working with the materials which were immediately to hand. Um, and uh, if it's 
very expensive and difficult to move materials out to the moon or Mars, then you are forced to work with the materials there and to deliver the minimum amount of material and equipment. So uh, our work with those two space agencies has been to harvest what is called regolith, which is the literally the soil, the dust of the surface, and using robotics uh, and small machines to mix that with an additive to create the equivalent of, uh, of high-grade concrete and robotically to create dome-like structures which because of the environment in outer space where you have, uh, um, how can I say, um, the equivalent of bullets traveling at the speed of a bullet, a small meteorite, so the structure has to be very deep to take that impact. And in our work, the research led us to look at the structure of human and animal bones, which is cellular. Uh, so it is, in a way, discovering a new vernacular. It's almost like the birth of buildings in the uh, early civilization. It was very much building with, with earth and literally the trees that were, were, were growing nearby. Thank you. My name is Nam Gyeong Hong, and I major in architecture in SNU. My question is about the design process. In the process, we focus on such, such a single purpose and sometimes miss other important things. For example, we focus on sustainability or structure, and we sometimes neglect the convenience of users or beauty. The reverse may also happen. So how do you resolve this problem? And how do you get started with your project and get ideas to develop your project? I think your question really strikes at the, uh, at the heart of creativity. Um, and um, it's a question in a different form I'm sometimes asked. You, when you're designing a building, are you starting with the outside um, or are you starting with the inside? And the, uh, that's perhaps another way of, of saying, are you concerned with the function of the building or its appearance? Um, surely the design process is not an either or. It has to be the pursuit of something that is going, going to fulfill its purpose. It's going to work within the available resources, whether those that's the dust on the moon or whether it's the steel or the concrete which is to hand. Um, it's also working within the restraints of resources which are cost and also time. Um, but beauty and the spirit is part of the function. So if it's not lifting your spirits or moving you or exciting you or making you feel joyful, um, then it's not fulfilling its function. So uh, for me, function is about all of the things that I've mentioned. And it, I don't see that it's an either or. I don't see if something's functional, then it can't be beautiful. Or if it's beautiful, it can't be functional. It's function is is all of the, the things, all of the constraints. And in many ways, um, I think one of the illusions, uh, one of the misunderstandings is that um, is, is, is somehow if you don't have a lot of money, you can't do something well. I think it's the reverse. Some of the best buildings have been built on very tight budgets, on very tight timescales. Um, and I think that's one of the excitements, one of the challenges of design. In some ways, the best designs come out of constraints. There's no such thing as, as, um, as no limits. 
there are always limits. And that's really the stimulus for design. Thank you. Uh, my name is Su Han Ji, and I'm majoring in religious studies and architecture. Uh, first of all, it's an honor to ask you a question. And one of the big topics these days in Korea is the problem of communication within communities. Uh, when Foster and partners take on big projects, I'm sure there will be communication problems as well. Um, at Pompidou exhibition, I was impressed memos, especially the ones on tip, team leadership, uh, which is about good professional project manager. Uh, can you share with us how you organize and run your teams? Do you have any special methods or tips for having communications? Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, one of the greatest compliments that, um, that anybody that I've worked with on a project, and I'm thinking of one particular project where the, uh, that individual who owned the company uh, was asked about me as an architect. And, um, and he afterwards shared what he'd said about me. And he said something to the effect that he's a good listener. And so as far as I'm able, working with colleagues, um, uh, I stress the importance of being a good listener. And that doesn't necessarily mean that if somebody tells you how they think that building should be, that you're necessarily going to do it like that. But I think it's, it's really important that you listen to many different voices in the same way that I believe passionately in a multidisciplinary approach. And again, um, I, I, I think there's a big difference between team working and design by committee. I can't think of anything worse than design by committee. That must be the ultimate horror. Um, but, but gathering all the voices and, uh, and really starting to understand what the generators of design, some of which might be very evident, it might be the climate, but some things maybe the cultural issues are more buried. Uh, more difficult to quantify. That doesn't mean to say that they're not, not important. So I think, I, I think listening, which is perhaps another word for research. So, um, and then the more information, the more knowledge you have, the more you're able then to make the right decisions. And ideally, those decisions emerge collectively if the communication is, is good, and, um, and perhaps in the best designs, at the end when you t start to pick it apart, it's sometimes very difficult to know who came up with what particular aspect of that, of that project. Thank you, I'll listen carefully from now. Incidentally, I mean, this is just such a great space for, uh, for a gathering like this. A very unexpected, uh, wonderful example of, of recycling and perhaps the ultimate exercise in sustainability is recycling a, a building rather than tearing it down and, and, and starting again. So congratulations, whoever was behind this initiative. Um, hello, my name is Inte, and I'm a student of university near Seoul and majoring in architecture. Uh, since your creation of Team 4, you influenced the world a lot as a pioneer of um, high-tech architecture. And today, the world is preparing for another big change with the fourth industrial revolution. Um, as one of the pioneers of high-tech movement, how do you see our world change following the fourth industrial revolution? Um, I think that probably if you start to identify the aspects of 
what might be another uh, industrial revolution, then uh, undoubtedly uh, words like artificial intelligence are going to loom large. But the reality is that however much we might choose to live in the virtual world or be influenced by that or to use uh, those emerging or more developed, because not exactly new, um, uh, we can't escape the physicality of the real world. I mean, we are here in concrete and, and steel. And, um, and a very noted scientist um, recently, a very interesting book, noted what he described and this is not somebody coming out of the construction industry. This is an independent scientist looking at issues of energy and resources um, and climate change and notes that the four pillars of modern civilization are ammonia in terms of its ability through fertilizers to, um, with very few tragic exceptions, virtually eliminate famine on the on, on the planet in terms of food production. And then went on to describe the importance of steel, concrete, uh, and plastic. The, the, the reality is that we do live in the, in the built world. And I think that if I was going to take a shortcut to what I see, but this is a very personal point of view, but it's heavily influenced by uh, the reading that I've uh, that I've taken advantage of or been exposed to. Um, I think it all comes down to the issue of, of energy. Um, at the moment, whether we like it or not, renewables in the form of solar um, and, and wind accounts for 10.5% of the electricity generated. And so for me, if I look at the mobile telephone, if I see the way in which communications have been decentralized, where we no longer have um, cables uh, across the countryside, we don't have telephone exchanges, um, we're completely liberated by a handheld device uh, invisibly linked to, to satellites. I think that, um, uh, that decentralizing energy and using the technology which does exist and looking at the statistics by far and away, the safest is nuclear, and the new generation nuclear enables a container-sized um, uh, micro-reactor, totally safe, uh, the size of a, of a container to power a Manhattan city block just parked in the basement, for example, or a small town. So, uh, and even nuclear in its conventional sense, and I think one third of Korea's energy is generated by nuclear, is far and away, statistically, by a huge margin, the, uh, the safest form of, of, uh, of, of energy uh, generation. Uh, so, um, so I think if, if, if eventually the world has to uh, come round to, to seeing the logic of that. And what is regarded as perhaps one of its difficulties is uh, in my view, its strength, the fact that it is the only uh, form of generating energy where you have total control of the waste. And uh, in, you know, in, in, in a typical lifetime, probably that waste is half a coffee cup. And unlike the billions of tons of carbon dioxide that we spew into the atmosphere, because we can't see it, um, the reality is it kills 10 million people every year, and a lot of those are children through burning wood or coal or animal uh, waste. So, um, so yes, I think for me the technology is there, um, and I think it's an exciting prospect. Thank you so much. Mine. My name is Jade Park, and I'm majoring architecture and engineering in Seoul National University. And my question is about education, and there are two points about it. So first one is, 
I heard that Norman Foundation is a great place to find learning opportunities. Can you give us more details on what we can learn there as an architect and what should we do to participate in? Also, the second point is, also, you're noted man for flexibly adapting sophisticated technology into architecture and appreciating the integrative decision-making process. In this context, while the world is rapidly changing and with schools emphasizing self-education, which vision and direction should architecture students pursue? Um, so, uh, taking the first question, um, the foundation, um, aside from the importance of its archive, um, its educational program uh, has, uh, since 2017, been running um, workshops. And uh, typically, a workshop will bring uh, 10 students from around the world with 10 world-leading experts as mentors. Uh, and that would occupy a week. Uh, there would be, it would be project based and at the end of that week a combination of live project work and talks by the, uh, by the mentors, um, there would be a final presentation at which the, uh, there would be representation of the, of the sponsors and, and also the, the mentors. The, the idea really focusing on issues of the city and particularly issues of sustainability, climate change, robotics, artificial intelligence, mobility. Um, and, um, and that is now developing into an, an institute. And that institute is offering a one-year course which starts next January um, on sustainable cities. And perhaps uh, it, the course reflects in some ways um, my, the division of my world um, into working with colleagues in practice on, on projects, uh, buildings, infrastructure, bridges, um, and my role in the foundation with students and mentors and thirdly, uh, with the United Nations as an advocate for the Forum of Mayors on the premise that probably because cities are the future and cities hold the key to combating climate change, the likelihood is that the civic leaders of the cities of the world are more powerful in terms of their advocacy to combat global uh, warming. So the course reflects in some ways, not entirely personally, but influenced by that. So the course will expose the scholars who are graduates, um, initially probably around 30, unlikely to exceed 100, initially based in Madrid, probably longer term expanding out to other, other countries. And will combine the best of academia in terms of the experts learning from the workshops. But the scholars will then engage directly with a city, which makes this course different from other courses because it will combine hands-on experience uh, and, um, and focusing on a neighborhood and using the the mission statement of the Institute, which seeks to define the best qualities of a city in terms of walkability, public transport, uh, neighborhoods, um, and, um, and initially the focus for this first year will be on European cities, so three European cities, but that will extend in future years where the focus might be on Asian cities. But the the methods that we'll be using, data-based, um, will be applicable to, uh, to any kind of, of city, mindful of the fact that there are many different kinds of cities. Um, 
That, I think, was the first part of the, of, of, of the question. The, the, the second part, I think, was um, uh, very much about, uh, uh, just remind me. Which vision and direction should architecture students pursue? Um, uh, I'd probably turn it on myself and say, if I had my time again as a student, what would I perhaps uh, do differently? Um, I, th I think that some things as an architect, um, I've, I've often said that as an architect, you don't have any power. You can't go onto a site and direct somebody to do something. You can't create a project. You're dependent on those who, uh, in a way, are the patrons of architecture. And ideally, those are enlightened individuals who want to uh, change the world for better in some way. Um, so I think that, uh, that as, a, as a designer, you, uh, you are dependent on your skills of communication, your skills of advocacy. Um, and I think that those perhaps can be taught rather than, as it were, learning them ha the hard way through, through practice. So I think that if I, if I had my time again as a student, on the basis that as an architect, I encourage uh, different disciplines. So the practice, for example, uh, I've structured where it has a core group of non-specialists, all kinds of different engineers, uh, different specialities from filmmaking to model making um, to three-dimensional modeling, um, and uh, breaking down the scale of the practice into smaller studios so that those studios can feed on those different disciplines. So perhaps if I had the luxury of being a student again, uh, I wouldn't change anything in terms of my background. I was very fortunate with the teachers that I had, um, and perhaps at the time I didn't really appreciate that. Uh, it's only looking back that I can appreciate the discipline perhaps of having to do a meticulous drawing or having to produce working details under pressure for a three-day test, which, um, which only much later I realized was very valuable. But probably time again, uh, I would do what you perhaps take for granted here, which is, I think, very unusual. The idea that, as I was discovering over lunch today, that you do two years uh, together as students of uh, of engineering and architecture, and then you uh, specialize either in architecture for three years or another two years for engineering. So I didn't have that, that luxury. I did break with tradition by asking uh, in Yale, which was unheard of, uh, to be able to work with an engineer, which, I, which in a way uh, changed my attitudes uh, much later. Um, so, uh, I, th I think that uh, whether it's uh, business management, whether it's drawing, wh wh whatever it is, I would probably encourage more skills outside of the traditional field of architecture. Because in a way, I think as an architect, you should be immersed in architecture and design, but you should be looking beyond architecture. Because really, what you're doing is you're you're designing for real life, which is multifaceted. Um, and, um, and perhaps the one thing uh, above all else, uh, I was asked uh, in the opening um, uh, event for the launch of the foundation, uh, what advice would I give to somebody who was graduating? And I said, stay a student, which is another way of, of saying, keep curious, keep, keep curious. Um, inquiring, um, and um, that's it. <laughs> Thank you for your answer. Uh -oh. Hello, I'm an English literature and architecture student at SNU. Um, so currently, career faces an ever more increase in single-person households. How can design solve dilemmas deriving from such phenomenon, such as the growth in social isolation 
and the creation of social forays. Can architecture be a solution to social problems and impact an individual in a behavioral manner? And you, through your um, art, consistently pursued the theme of connectivity. Um, and I was wondering if you could walk us through some of the specifics of your philosophies and uh, design processes. Thank you. I think, absolutely, architecture can be life-changing. Um, we, when I started practice, which was six decades ago, I believed passionately that a humanistic architecture where you might have the benefit of natural light, of a link to nature, of capturing a view, um, would be good for you. Uh, but I couldn't prove it. But since then, uh, there are scientific tests. We now know that somebody after surgery, uh, if the patient's room has a view, they leave hospital earlier, they recover faster. And I could give you so many examples from, uh, from practice uh, of the transformative power of architecture, the healing power of architecture. There's a, a very small project in Scotland and the people who were looking after the patients in that very small, I think it was less a, a hospital, um, not a hospice, but a care center. And we um, designed that as a cluster of small dwellings around um, a courtyard in the, in the countryside. And there's a, a fascinating film where a nurse is explaining that she doesn't have to give this patient the same amount of drugs before because the architecture has completely changed the behavior of that, of that person. And I could show you a film of a more recent project, a Maggie's Center, which is um, uh, a charity for, um, for cancer therapy, for um, counseling those who've been diagnosed in an institutional hospital. And nearby is this center, uh, which is about informing the patient, reinsuring the patient, and consciously, the design of that is absolutely low-key. The building is the opposite of institutional. It's deliberately low, small pitch roof. It has a porch. It has a greenhouse to grow flowers. It has a hearth, a fireplace. It has a kitchen. Um, it's all the elements of uh, what might make a home rather than housing. The materials are natural. The garden is lush and protective. And, um, and if you hear on film, patients talking about their experience, you realize that it's totally the power of, of design. I think we're, all of us, our quality of life is affected by the environment that we're in, whether it's a building, whether it's a street. Um, so, so I think it's, it's, um, it's the ultimate power of design for, for good. Thank you. Hello. Um, first of all, I'd like to say it's an honor to have you here and thank you for our answering our questions. My name is Jamana and I'm a second year in architecture here at SNU. And I'm from Saudi Arabia. So actually, the question that I wanted to ask had to do with one of your first uh, buildings that you've built in the Middle East, which is the Faisalia Tower in Riyadh in 1999. Um, my question is, how were you able to design a building that came to be a symbol of the capital when the only reference of architecture in Riyadh was the historical city of Dereya? And if we compare Riyadh to Paris 200 years ago, what pushes architects to design like the Baron Haussmann did uh, in the early 19th century or build a tower uh, using new materials and technologies such as the Eiffel Tower in the late 19th century? When is it important for you to draw inspiration from the existing architecture and urban fabric of a region or focus on your personal vision of a project to create a landmark? <clears throat> um, I think that I, I thought it might be helpful if we had an image of the building that you're talking about. So 
um, I was given this on arrival and I was told if I press on the right button then perhaps something might come up which obviously it doesn't work but it doesn't ah so that's the building that you were talking about and um, and that photograph was taken at the the date that you described I think it was 19 uh, late 1980s and um, it was a solitary tower I think if we would take the same photograph now it might be lost in the skyscape as it were um, it was um, oops it doesn't matter um, you, you, you will remember that it's um, so it, like any project it came out of looking at a whole range of, of options the traditional village that you're referring to didn't really offer any any clues for a high-rise building um, and and so it's perhaps a, a, an unusual challenge to design the first tower in what you know is going to end up being a whole series of towers and the tower becomes part of a cluster. So yes, there is an element of this being a three-dimensional sculpture, so it's non-directional and it becomes um, in a way symbolic of the, of, of the place. So that was our first building in the, in the Middle East. And, um, and culturally, I was, as the designer, as it were, um, uh, introduced perhaps to a new way of thinking about buildings because um, all my experience had been that you did a design, the project started on site, and it got built. The Middle East I discovered was not necessarily like that. So when this project was, and if you move to the next one perhaps, um, you'll see that at the top there is that, uh, is that sphere. And um, if you go to the next slide, you'll start to see some of my exploratory sketches for that spherical, uh, diagridded um, restaurant. And the next one, perhaps. And the next one. And the next one. And so there it is built, the view out of the restaurant. The restaurant was never part of the original design. The, uh, those who'd commissioned the building, when the building was under construction, said, hey, wouldn't it be great to have a restaurant at the top? And the building's being built. So <laughs> this was a new way of thinking about design. In a way, nothing was impossible. And so that was a late addition. And, um, and perhaps in the exploration of those many variations to finally find something that would look um, as, a, as a sculptural object from different directions. It incorporated art, it incorporated stained glass. There's an environmental story. I think if you come up the next one and the next one, yes, there's a story about water and recycling and, and so on. But there were no real uh, clues apart from the environment. So there's quite heavy shading on this building. That was a detail earlier. We don't need to go back to it. Which again is, is unusual. In other words, it wasn't a standard Western curtain wall. Um, but if I... If I could, and I can't, so I'm going to just describe, um, ideally, the answer to your question would be Mazda. And Mazda is uh, an institute for researching renewable energy. It's in the desert of Abu Dhabi, um, and, um, and it's totally solar powered. And the reason that it can achieve the 
quality in, of life, if you like, in the desert that we take for granted, the ability to be able to go into a space, it's boiling hot outside, but it's refreshingly cool inside, the water comes out of the taps, the lights come on when you press a switch, there's only solar cells powering that. That was only possible by reducing, by design, the energy load of the building. And those lessons were learned from traditional uh, desert architecture in an age before you had cheap energy and could throw a switch. So those were about um, uh, orientation. They were about shade, the width of a street, the way in which you would create shadow um, so the streets would be scaled for pedestrians because this was before the age of automobiles. So in that development, the phase that we were responsible for, there are no cars on the main level. The whole um, development is lifted up to take advantage of the upper desert breezes. There are towers which capture the higher breeze pull that down past um, the equivalent of, in the past, the cooling towers would draw air from the cooler upper layers, pull it past wet um, fabric for evaporative cooling. So we would work on the today's equivalent of that. The exterior would be layered so that the outer layer was absorbing the heat and air was moving between the layers. So we applied all those lessons which we learned from traditional. Now, it didn't look like traditional, but on the other hand, the, the two materials that we used, one was inflated plastic um, uh, bubbles, which were always cool to the touch. The other one, and these were really a series, Mazda is a series of experiments. Um, and some of those experiments were successful um, and enough of them were successful because it's still functioning as a research institute 24-7, using a lot of energy, totally solar powered. Um, uh, so, so yes, there's a very direct connection there between early Islamic architecture, the environmental lessons and the final uh, architecture of that, of that development. I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much. Sir, if you don't mind, is there anything you want to say to the student? Um, I'm running out of things to say. <laughs> I'm, ha I'm happy to take any, uh, any other ad hoc uh, questions. Um, Oh. That's up to you. <laughs> yes, okay. Then, um, uh, yeah, this is my honor to ask you some questions. Um, I watched your interview on YouTube. I watched it over and over again, and I com contemplated about the words you said. So anyway, my question is, um, this Three questions. Can I ask you three questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have the microphone. You have the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So first, I'm gonna start with uh, some kind of naive question. Um, how can we be a star like you, including me and all the crowds here? <laughs> I I I think that we're we're all of us products of, of influences. And I think we take those influences and, um, and some of those influences, I think, as designers, we're, we're consciously aware of them. Uh, uh, it might be the way in which uh, we've perhaps seen a building by an architect where there is a hierarchy of spaces 
Um, I'm thinking perhaps of an architect like Kahn, where some of those spaces become served and some are servant spaces. But maybe those principles have not been applied to, let's say, a high-rise building. Um, and when we apply those principles to a high-rise building, then somebody says, well, that's an innovation. It's not been done before. And that's true. But almost certainly, it's, it has appeared like that because of those influences, that background. So some of that can be conscious, and a lot of it, I think, is subconscious. Um, but we're all the, it was an earlier question, we're all a product of those who teach us, those who educate us, those who inspire us, uh, whether that's direct contact with a teacher or whether it's a book that we've read or whether it's a painting we look at or whether it's a beautiful automobile or it's an aircraft in the sky defying gravity, um, uh, whether it's about light and lightness, whether it's the way a grasshopper seems to almost levitate over, over the ground or a helicopter is, is airborne. So I think, I think we're all a product of, and, and we take advantage of that and we shape it in, in perhaps ways which become more personal. Um, and, um, and in that more open forum of design where perhaps you're brainstorming and we saw a lot of uh, different variations. It's very difficult to know, perhaps, uh, to go back in time, who was brainstorming around the table, because I think the round table is emblematic of a non-hierarchical approach to design, where you're encouraging as many uh, observations, uh, inputs, uh, ideas, contributions. Um, so, so I think that um, I think that. Is, is my response to the first of your three questions. Okay. Uh, thank you. So we need innovations of innovations, right? Yeah. I, I mean, it's getting harder to, for young architects to leave this new era because we need new innovations. Uh, uh, yeah, so anyway, my second question is a bit related with this. Um, I wonder your opinions about low-tech architecture, low-tech. Yeah, what I, why, the reason why I'm asking you this is um, for young architects, when they start their business, they should have projects that is um, made with low tech compared to high budget projects. So it is inevitable for young architects to deal with that. But when they make success, they can make um, they can deal with huge projects with high budget, so they can deal with some kind of high-tech architecture. So then should we regard high-tech architecture as a goal of architects' life? I, I can't really, um, I, I think it's, it's whatever is appropriate. Um, it, and um, I'm very suspicious of the labels of high-tech and low-tech. Frankly, I really don't know what they mean because uh, it, it, it depends on the circumstances of a project, what, what is available for that project. So in some cultures, that might be uh, the cheapest way, of, the fastest way of doing it, depending on the nature of that building, might be steel. On the other hand, it might be wood. I mean, if you look at the history of the balloon frame in American domestic architecture, it's essentially the story of something called the four by two. That's four inches by two inches. Um, I'll not translate that into metric, but it's a very small piece of wood. And you use those at very close centers, and you can build quickly and economically. Um, and uh, some of those buildings with the outdoor porches, which probably people have forgotten in an air-conditioned environment, uh, the benefits of the, of, of the porch. So, um, so I think that the design is about whatever is appropriate, and whether that is wood, whether it's uh, 
I mean, recently we have a project at, at the moment um, adjacent to the Venice Biennale in a garden. It's a refugee housing, and it, it's perhaps an interesting um, mix of an earlier question, just looking at the time, excuse me, um, of, uh, of the foundation workshop and its link to the real world. So uh, the one workshop set the challenge of refugee housing and the sponsor was a building supplier, principally of, uh, of cement for, for not, not entirely, but, but a large part of, of that market. And, um, and the students um, began to realize as we were informed by the United Nations expert on site that typically refugee housing is a canvas tent and it probably has one year life. And there's a more sophisticated version of that which has involved IKEA and we had that product in the foundation uh, courtyard and it was built by the foundation team. Uh, and that has a three year life. But the average uh, time in a refugee camp is 17 years. So uh, the students quite rightly challenged that and said, but what's temporary and what's permanent? Why couldn't you build something more permanent very quickly? Um, and, um, and that was in June of last year. And, uh, and in August, the building supplier came back and said, what if we have this site in Venice and you've got six months and we put that proposition into action, could you deliver a refugee shelter very quickly? Could you, could you bring that proposition alive? And what we did is um, we went back to the principle of what an artisan would have done to create the most efficient arch. The artisan would have held a piece of string or rope and gravity would define the most beautiful economic arch, which if you turned it, if you could stiffen it and turn it through 180 degrees, would give you this very efficient, very beautiful arch. So that was a starting point and that was a six meter arch. And we, if I cut the uh, story very short, um, we created a temporary lightweight formwork of that arch. We found a product which had never been used for buildings before, which was a canvas impregnated with low carbon cement. And if you draped it as we did over that form and wrapped it underneath, when you sprayed it with water, in hours it would be stiff in 24 hours, it will be structurally rigid. And then we flat packed the interior, erected it, and it's there in the garden in, in Venice. And the reaction of everybody who's seen it is, I'd love to spend a night in it. I'd love one of those. In other words, this which had come out of the most demanding circumstances, where you could build it in a few days for a few thousand euros, was suddenly something that everybody saw as a, you know, a place that they would love to sleep in. So uh, I, I think that in some ways that comes back to the earlier question about you know, beauty, utility. I think it links back into the foundation and it also um, comes into, you know, what is, is that low tech? Is it high tech? In the end, the words don't really matter. They're journalistic inventions. Thank you, so it's not about high tech, low tech. Uh, I'm sorry, so can I add one question that I really wonder? I think there's just um, one. I think yeah. there's time for just one and then... Afterwards, afterwards. Uh, let's, let's continue. The, so, last question. <laughs> This is short, but you, you mind if, uh, if someone had some questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Uh, I was also going to, so my name is Ji Hoon, and I was also going to ask two questions, but since our time is limited, I will only ask the most important one. So, uh, you have talked about sustainability in buildings and reducing the energy consumption and changing the energy source of these buildings into solar, but um, our world is changing really fast, and in some regions just this year, entire forests larger than our entire country has burned into ashes. And there's 8 billion people in this world, and these people are striving to get better lives and use more energy. And I think our world something could, might need something more than just sustainability and just trying to react to these problems that we have. Maybe we have to react more proactively and change our way of life entirely in order to combat the situation that we're having. What do you think about the role of architecture in this kind of situation? I come back to my earlier proposition that the, we need an abundance of clean energy. And if you look at the wider picture, if you look at the emergence of a nation like Africa, by its own estimation to be able to cope, Nigeria to cope with population explosion, with the challenge to have the quality of life for everybody in Nigeria that we take for granted, by 2050, we'll need 15 times the amount of, of energy. And I think it's very important to go back to the data without in any way uh, underrating the importance, the challenge of climate change, which is absolutely uh, imminent. But on the other hand, if you look statistically at the fires, there are fewer fires today than there have been over the last century. If you look at a graph of fires, and that's in no way to diminish the importance of combating fires, which in many cases are of course, California, two and a half million people without electricity. That was caused by an aging infrastructure where the pylons, the power pylons, ignited dry trees. That, so statistically, there are less fires. There's a graph which has been published, and you can see that. And that's, uh, that was promoted by one of the leading uh, proponents to combat climate change. Climate change. So I, th I think that um, we are very familiar with the media. Bad news is always good for newspaper sales. Um, but we need to get down to the facts, down to the data. Uh, which brings us back to the course, which is about the realities of data. So you have to separate emotion from reality. I think that's it because we had an hour and I'm conscious of the fact that we have to move on to another event. Uh, so uh, thank you all very much and uh, great questions uh, and uh, good luck to everybody. This is, Norman, would you like to present your live production? This is for, for the university. This is for the university, yes. So. There's always a surprise. I was never expecting this. So I'm, I'm uh, apparently donating uh, two volumes here to the university. I think that um, what I should say is that traditionally the publisher creates a book which is about projects and so this kind of, I can't even lift it with one hand, so um, this, the grey book is about projects. Uh, you can do some weight training. Uh, <laughs> so you, <laughs> The, the, the second book is, in many ways, a kind of anticipation of some of the questions that you've raised about influences, inspirations. So uh, this is my writing, and in both books, I've composed each of the pages. So this could be about flight, it can be about the influence of mountains, sport, uh, aircraft, whatever. So. Um, I'm going to devote it to
to you at the university and uh, another way of saying thank you. For good studies. That's what it says, for good studies. So, for good studies. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you very much.